Go ahead and go to the book of John. John chapter 8. I've been looking forward to this chapter. John, this this chapter right here, the first part of this chapter, uh, this is one of the most popular passages in the Bible. In fact, I mean, this is the first part of chapter 8. This is a safe passage. Pretty, any, any church will preach on this passage. Any liberal church will preach on the first part of this passage. You've all heard it a zillion times. But this is a pretty long chapter. There's 59 verses in this chapter. And most of this chapter, you will never hear preached on. And you will find out why. And you especially won't find this chapter preached on in most Baptist churches. And, but let's go ahead and we're going to get through the popular part first because you've all heard this a thousand times. And it says in verse 1, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, rode on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and rode on the ground. And they, when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So you all know this story right here. And uh, just a couple things I want to point out here. You know, the whole point of this thing, it's not Jesus doing away with the death penalty like a lot of people teach. It's not teaching us that we should not have a problem with anybody's sin. You know, including things like adultery that's still breaking one of the Ten Commandments. The whole point of this, they put Jesus in an impossible situation. What do we do? The law says to stone her. Yes, the Old Testament law said to stone her. But you see later in the book of John, it wasn't lawful for the Jews to put anyone to death. It was the Romans who did that. They had Roman, they were under Roman law too. And so Jesus, he's in a tough spot here. He can either go against the law of God's word. Or he can go against Roman law. Well, what do you think is going to happen? If he goes along with Roman law, then the Pharisees are going to go say, this man teaches against the law. He teaches contrary to the word of God. If he goes with the word of God, then they're all going to go run to the Romans saying, this man, you know, got everyone to stone this woman, which is against the law. And now he's in trouble with the Romans. But what did Jesus do? He did the famous statement, he that was without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. And then it says they were convicted by their own consciences. And just an interesting thing about that too, that that verse right there, verse 9, where it says convicted, that's the only place in the Bible where you ever see the word convict of any kind. That's the only place. And I say that because there's a lot of people that are teaching this idea, if you're going to get saved... You know, you got to be under Holy Ghost conviction. You've got to be, I mean, you've got to be sorry for your sins and down on your, you know, yourself. And you've got to just be, you know, at the end of your rope. And finally, you know, you just get under so much conviction, you know, you finally turn to Christ. But if that was the case, wouldn't we see a lot of verses saying that was a requirement for salvation? But what do we see? It's just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think people ought to be convicted for their sins, and many times we do get convicted for our sins, but I think most conviction comes after salvation. You know, most of the world, they're completely fine doing the sins that they do. But you know what? And, you know, the Bible teaches, though, that, you know, we got to get the gospel to them, we got to show them, hey, there's a penalty for that sin. And the Bible doesn't say if they get convicted and believe, they'll get saved. No, it says if they'll believe, they'll get saved. And, you know, we can try to make them feel bad, I guess, if we want. But, you know, we could use the Kirk Cameron, uh, you know, Ray Comfort approach to doing that, get people feeling really bad, make them feel like the scum of the earth. But the thing that we forget about that, the thing that Christians are forgetting like crazy, the thing that I try to teach everybody through those Ten Commandment messages is that, you know, we can get them feeling like garbage so they'll turn to Christ. But the only problem with that is even after they turn to Christ, Aren't we still pathetic? 
aren't we still dirty, rotten sinners? You know, where, you know, obviously, you know, you get saved and the Holy Spirit starts doing the work in your life. You can start getting rid of certain sins, but we're still disgusting in the eyes of God. And it's not hard. You don't have to read a whole lot of Bible, even as a saved person, to start getting convicted for your sin. And notice, too, you know, people are like, you got to have that Holy Ghost conviction. You know, it's a requirement for salvation. Holy Ghost conviction. But the Bible never talks about that. Here it says they were convicted by their own consciences. It doesn't even say the Holy Spirit convicted them. It says they, their own consciences convicted them. So that's just a false doctrine. It's false teaching. It's not based on the Bible. It sounds good. I like the idea of getting somebody to feel really bad. Sorry for their sin. So hopefully they'll quit doing those things. But it's not, it's not a requirement for salvation. And so then in verse 12, so this part here, you've, we've, you know, you've all heard a thousand sermons. If you want to hear another sermon on it, just go listen to the preaching on the radio on Sunday morning. One of the guys will probably preach on, on that passage. I can almost guarantee it. And so uh, we don't need another message on that. Because, but the rest of this chapter, I am afraid that many Baptists either have never read I'm sure they've read it in their Bible reading, but I think they were thinking about golf or hunting or something while they were reading that. They weren't paying any attention. And you definitely won't hear any preaching on it unless it's Baptists like us. Then, you know, that, we'll, we'll use this chapter all the time. And so look, let's start reading in verse 12. So at first it says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Once again, Jesus speaking spiritually here, okay? Was Jesus Christ's body itself the source of light in the world? Okay, obviously not, but spiritually he was the light of the world. He was that light, but men love darkness rather than light. He was the creator of light too. But once he's speaking spiritually here, okay, if people are going to get saved, or people who didn't get saved, it was because they loved darkness rather than light. They wouldn't come to the light lest their deeds should be reproved. And Jesus Christ is that light. He is that light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And so verse 12 says, Then spake Jesus again, or I read that verse 13, The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. The Pharisees, they're trying to make an argument that Jesus' word wasn't reliable because there was no one else to back up his claim. Remember the message I preached a few weeks back about bearing false witness. How it's at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. You should never just take one person's word as fact. That is a, that is a terrible thing. When you're making when uh, you're making a judgment, okay, don't just believe everything you hear. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, and here Jesus comes along and he's telling them things that they've never heard before, and they're basically. We're going to see here, they're using what the law says, the law of God, as an excuse not to listen to His words. But if we go back and we're not even going to look at all the places throughout, you know, throughout the book of John, we see constantly Jesus was trying to get people to believe Him. You know, believe me. You know, listen to me. Follow me. You've got to, you've got to believe me. And that's how a person gets saved. They believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But isn't that just one person? And so they're saying, you know, we don't have to, uh, we don't have to listen to you. You're just, you're just bearing record of yourself and your record's not true. Verse 14, Jesus answered therefore, or Jesus, and said unto them, though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true for I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I came and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, Ye should have known my father also. Now, this here, this isn't a te- this isn't that teaching that Jesus is the Father that people try to use, and they'll try to use some of this here, because what people do too with this passage is, you know, they'll say, well, yeah, it was two witnesses because Jesus is speaking as the Son, and He was speaking as a Father at the same time. But you know, that doesn't that doesn't make any sense. People will try to make the argument too. You know, it's like me. You know, I'm a father. 
but I'm also a son. But yet, my witness only counts as one witness, doesn't it? I can't just go and testify and then say, Here, here's me, the father, telling you this, and then here's me, the son, telling you this too. What, what does this mean when he's talking about the father uh, bearing record too? Well, you'll notice it's because he said, because the father hath sent me. Now, what's something that we still do today that is similar to that? We send ambassadors to other country, don't we? And they many times will speak on behalf of the president. You know, they will go there. You know, maybe, uh, maybe an ambassador will go and he will go and he'll talk to a leader in a foreign government and he'll say, you know, this is what America's going to do. This is from the president of the United States. And usually they'll have something, you know, maybe in writing, something with a presidential seal on it, something with a signature, something they can look at and verify that, yes, this guy is, in fact, an ambassador. He was, in fact, sent by the president of the United States. And then they will take that ambassador's word as though it came directly from the mouth of the president. And that makes perfect sense. And Jesus did the same thing. He was sent to earth by the Father, wasn't he? So while it's Jesus that's speaking by himself, it's, the, it's God the Son speaking, he was speaking on behalf of the Father because it was the Father that had sent him. And you say, well, where's the proof? Well, the proof was in those miracles that he did. God gave him the ability to do all those miracles so people would know that this was in fact the Christ. This was in fact the Messiah. And not only that, not only did he have, you know, God give him the ability to do the miracles and things that he did, but he also had the word of God too. It's very clear just from the Old Testament that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. So when Jesus was speaking, you know, he was, he was sent by the Father. Therefore, his witness, the things he said, it was two witnesses. The people should have listened to him. They had every reason to listen to him. It was legal according to their law to listen to him because it, this wasn't just Jesus speaking. He was sent by the Father. And you know what? We, do, we see these things all, all the time in our life where somebody might get sent on behalf of an authority figure. And we're supposed to recognize that. You know, we're supposed to, to listen. You know, whether it be a police officer that comes to your house and maybe gives you a summons telling you to show up at court at a certain day, okay, you better listen to that police officer because it's not just the police officer that's telling you that. He's telling you that on behalf of a judge. And that judge is the one who is in authority, who uh, commissioned that police officer to give you that summons, and you better listen. If you don't listen to that police officer, you're not listening to the judge. And so it's the same thing when we don't listen to the words of Jesus... We're not listening to God. If you don't believe Jesus, you don't believe God. And that's just a fact. And we're going to see that throughout this passage. But that's what he's trying to explain here when he's saying, you know, his, my witness, this isn't just mine, but it's the Father that sent me. Not the Father that is me. The Father that sent me. And so, uh, look at verse... Um, oh, another thing, too, I wanted to mention, too. The same way that Jesus was speaking right here, it was the same way the prophet spoke in the Old Testament, didn't they? What, did, what was it Ezekiel said all the time? Was it, you know, hear the word of the Lord. You hear, thus saith the Lord. And then who was it that would actually be speaking? It would be guys like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. They would be the ones talking, but when the people would not listen to them, who did God get? You know, God got mad at them for not listening to Him. Even, and one thing that we see all the time that would happen in the Old Testament, these prophets would come along, they would just say what God told them to say, and what they, they do? They would attack the prophet. And that's exactly what they ended up doing with Jesus too. You had guys like Jeremiah, they got thrown into a prison. All he did was gave him the word of the Lord. And they, they went after him for it. And many prophets were killed. You had Micaiah that was, you know, he was struck in the face. After just giving them the word of the Lord. It wasn't their word. It was God's word. And when God would see the people reject the prophet that he had sent, God saw that as direct disobedience to him. And one of the things that, you know, an area where I learned this lesson growing up was 
many times my dad would commission my sisters to go tell me to do something. Now, I always hated that, too, because a lot of times my sisters would be snotty about it. You know, Dad told you to go do this. You know, Dad told you to go take, take out the garbage. So you have to go do it right now. You know, and then they'd get all bossy about it. And they'd say, that, say it like that, and then I didn't want to do it. But the problem with that was when I, I don't have to listen to you. Well, then what would they do? They'd go tell Dad. And Dad didn't see it as disobedience to my sisters. He saw it as disobedience to him. And it would get me in trouble. And my sisters would love it. And so I always liked when I would get commissioned to tell my sisters to do something, and I would make the best of it, and uh, that's why we fought a lot. But anyway, uh, that but we all we all know what this is like, and so that's what was going on here with Jesus. And so, uh, you know, Jesus was sent by the Father, and you, because Jesus was God, you know, you could say he was able to speak for himself. You know, and you know, you might not like that answer, but you know. The children of Israel didn't like that answer either. That when Jesus was saying, hey, you heard it from me, this is from the Father. Show us the Father. We want to see the Father. I'd like to see what would happen if a police officer comes to your house and gives you a summons. You're like, I want to see the judge. I'm not, I'm not going there to the court. Not until I see the judge. Go ahead and tell him that. All right, and you can write us a letter about it from jail. And tell us what happened. All right, you, that's not how it works, and that's what the Jews did too. They're like, no, we want to see the Father. We're not going to listen to you. Show us the Father. Say, so, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And you know what? When a policeman comes like that, commissioned by a judge, you know what? That should be enough for us right there. He gave us the word of the judge. He gave us the summons, whatever, right there, and just you better go. You better go with it. You better listen. And we need to understand that you know, we all have a court date one of these days. We're going to stand before God one of these days. And we have been, you know, we have been summoned. You have been summoned by a preacher, by the Word of God. And if we do not listen to that, if we don't believe it, we're never going to see the Father. But listen, if you do believe it, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've seen the Father. It hasn't happened yet, but it's as good as happened. You're... you're fate is sealed. You are going to heaven. Nothing can stop that. And so verse 20, it says, these words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no man laid hands on him for his hour was not, not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way and you shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he saith, whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And as he spake these words, Many believed on him. So notice here that you know those who remain in unbelief are condemned. You know he that believeth not is condemned already. Jesus said, "Where I'm going, ye cannot come." Talking about heaven. Why? They didn't believe him. If you don't believe Christ, you're going to hell. If you do not believe on him, you will die in your sins. Those who are saved, we're still sinners too. But when you believe on Christ, we get cleansed from our sins. We get cleansed from our sins only by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know we all know that here, and I know that seems real elementary here, but one thing that we're, we're seeing is, I'm telling you, this dispensational stuff that's going through churches is absolutely horrible. It has messed up people's minds. It's messed up their theology so bad. And there are, there are people teaching, you know, there have been multiple ways of salvation throughout time, and different ways of salvation to come. 
And that's just completely not true. And I'm going to show you some things here in a little bit. Something too, I just, I read in a book that was just absolutely horrible. And people are falling for this stuff. But listen, we all understand, everything I just said there, everybody would agree with. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Don't believe you're condemned. You'll die in your sins. The context of this here, he's talking to the Jews. And many of those people that he talked to, it says they believed. Okay? Many of them believed. But then look at verse 31. He says, Then said Jesus unto those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So, if we continue in his word, we'll be his disciples. Now, does that mean if we continue in his word, we'll be saved? Hey, there's a difference between being saved and being a disciple. Okay? And a lot of times people will read stuff like that. No, if you don't continue in the word, you didn't really get saved. Or if you don't continue in the word, if you don't change, you're not really saved. No, if you don't continue in the word, you won't be his disciple. There's a difference between being saved and being a disciple. Someone who gets saved and they never do anything for God, they don't follow Christ, they're not his disciple. Well, I don't think, if you're not following Christ, there's no way you're going to get to heaven. Oh, you mean you don't think a person who doesn't follow Christ after salvation deserves to go to heaven? So now you think you do deserve to go to heaven? Where did you get that idea? You know, what, where did you get the idea that you ever, on the best day of your life, deserve to go to heaven? We all deserve to go to hell, even on our best day. And so, uh, look at, lost my spot here, uh, verse 33. It says, Then an they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye should be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. But And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Notice these people here too. You know, they're saying we've never been in bondage to any man. Okay, well, first of all, maybe their generation, I don't know if they were thinking their generation, them as a people, but Israel was constantly in bondage to different people, weren't they? They were in bondage in Egypt. They were in bondage many times by the Canaanites during their history. They were in bondage to uh, you know, Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, to Greece. And at this time, they were even in bondage to Rome. But you know what? Those weren't the worst things they were ever in bondage to. They were all in bondage to their sin up until this day. And Je that's what Jesus came to free us from. Okay, Not to give us freedom, you know, national freedom, to, but to give us freedom from our sin because that's what's going to get us thrown into hell. You can be under a dictatorship, but still be saved and still go to heaven. And you can live in a free country and still go to hell. Jesus came to save people from their sins. And these guys, they're thinking, we're Abraham's seed. We're all good. What are you... And, and, they're, and notice what some of the things they're saying. Some of the stuff they say to him is horribly, horribly blasphemous. But they're looking at him and they're looking at themselves like, who are you to talk to us? We're Abraham's seed. And, you know, I'm growing up... Did anybody here know Jack Parchman, Evangelist Jack Parchman? All right. I was curious, she did. When, when he would preach all the time, one of the things he would say all the time for years, I never knew where he got this from. I was like, I don't ever remember seeing that anywhere in the Bible. But it actually is in the Bible. It just wasn't in the terms that he used. But he would always talk about you know, the Jews and the terrible things they said to Jesus. They told him he had a devil. They told him he was a bastard baby. He would say that all the time. And I'm like, when did they ever say that? Well, actually, they say it here in a little bit. They, they do. They, they're like spreading rumors about him. Because here he is talking down to them, but they were Abraham's seed. We are the chosen people. We are special. But look what it says in verse, uh, let's keep reading. Verse 37, I know that ye are Abraham's seed. I know where you come from. I know where you descend from. I know you're Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. Y'all see that? 
Hey, I know who you descend from. But you know what? He says, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Saying, you say, if, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what Abraham did, but you're doing something different than what Abraham did. You're doing what your father does. And he tells them who their father is in just a little bit. But he said, this did not Abraham. What is Abraham known for? He is the father of those that be of faith. And those are the children of Abraham. And some doofus the other day, man, he, you know, he left a comment on the YouTube channel saying something about, you know, he called, he called the Jews the children of God. And I just responded to him. Have you, I, I put that verse in the Bible in Romans where it says they that are of the flesh are not the children of God. I wish I could get some of these Zionist Baptists to try to answer that scripture. They won't do it. And right here, Jesus told them, no, you're not the children of Abraham. You know why? Because they didn't have faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted to them for righteousness. They did not believe God. They're not the children of Abraham. And Jesus flat out tells them that. He said, ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. That's where that comes from. Brother Parchman's line that he said all the time where it says, we be not born of fornication. Implying that Jesus was born in an illegitimate way. And we know that was not the case. That he was born of a virgin. He was born of a, from a woman more pure than any of their mothers. Every one of them. His mom was more pure than any of theirs. Not because she was you know, the sacred, blessed virgin like the Catholic seat, but she was actually a virgin. Conceived of the Holy Ghost, and yet they are, they're making him out to be illegitimate, born of fornication. And it says, We have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, if God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. You know, and who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is a Christ. What religion is known for that? Judaism. They're liars. They're the synagogue of Satan. They're of the devil. They're not the chosen people. We're not supposed to bless those people. Verse 45, And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Now, listen, I know it's a simple question, all right? Go ahead and answer it. Don't be afraid. Why were they not of God? Why were they not the children of God? What made them incapable of hearing God's word? They weren't saved. They weren't sa Therefore, they weren't the children of Abraham. They weren't saved because they didn't have any faith. And so he's taught, you, know, you can't hear these things. You can't understand these things. They hardened their heart. They would not believe him. Look at this in verse 48. Then answered the Jews and said, uh, and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. So now not only are they saying, you know, you're illegitimate, but they're saying too, you know, your father was a Samaritan. That, you know, your mom, you know, fooled around with some Samaritan, which was, you know, considered a horrible thing back then. And they told him he has a devil. They told you're filled, you're, you're possessed. You're demon possessed. I mean, horrible blasphemy being spoken of right here. I mean, just, I mean, there is, there is no other religion that's as blasphemous as Judaism. Even in their own Talmud, they teach that Jesus is in hell burning and boiling in hot excrement. That's what, they, that's what they teach about him. That's what they feel about our Messiah and their Messiah. That's, that's how they feel. They hate him. They are not of faith and they are not the children of Abraham. They are not the chosen people. And then verse 49, Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, now we know that, that thou hast a devil. 
Abraham is dead in the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Okay, and, this, and this is just kind of a side note here. I, I'm, I'm going to be probably preaching a message on this pretty soon. But I, I talked about this before. You know, people, they get real freaked out. And when you start, I, I mentioned the other night in church about how Jesus went to hell for the three days. And people get so freaked out by that. And, but the Bible says that the, one of the reasons Jesus had to die on the cross was the taste of death for every man. And you all understand that those who believe, we don't ever really die. We don't taste death. Physically we do, but spiritually we never will. Spiritually, we will never taste death. We will never experience one second of hell. You know why? Because Jesus did that for us. He tasted of death, the Bible says, for every man. And understand that yes, He was paying for our sins. His blood that He shed was on the cross. But that payment that He made on the cross had to result in death. Real death. And for it to be real death, you have to go to hell. And that's exactly what He did. And so, right there, because here it says, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Well, if Jesus, uh, you know, hadn't gone to hell, then he didn't really taste death, did he? And the truth is, if tasting death was just him physically dying, well, then all of us are going to taste of death, aren't we? All of us are going to eventually, unless the rapture comes. But no, we'll never taste of death because we will never go to hell. Because we will immediately, once we are absent from this body, we will be present with the Lord. So thank God for that. Verse 53, Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets which are dead, which, uh, whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him, that if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham, so there he's calling him their father again. Notice how he's kind of going back and forth because yes, physically, Abraham was their father, but spiritually, he was not their father. Abraham, or your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said, said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. I mean, you all see what happened right there. Jesus flat out called himself God. He said before Abraham was, I am. They knew that title, I am. They were familiar with that was. And when they heard him say that, they picked. They were. They were ready to stone him, but somehow I think it was. I think it was a miracle here. Jesus was able to get away from them because it wasn't his time. It was not his time to die. Stoning was not the way that God wanted him to die, and so he did. He passed through the midst of them, and and he got away. But boy, this did. This fired them up because in their minds he was speaking blasphemy. But you and I know that was absolutely true. He had every right to say that. And, you know, and even while he's there, you know, he's not lifting up himself. He's not giving himself honor. But the Father did give him honor. The Father is the one who gave him a name that's above every name. And these people, they're, getting, they're angry. They hate him. You know why? Because they did not believe him. They had no faith. And, no, and the title of this message is Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham. Jesus Christ is that promised seed. Being the seed of Abraham, we see, has nothing to do with genetics. Are Jews today physically descended from Abraham? Yes, but who cares? Look what it says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6. It says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are blessed with faithful Abraham. Um, lost my spot. Uh, or they, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, and thee 
Shall all nations be blessed? Oh, that's the Jews. We've got to bless the Jews. You know, we're all blessed by the Jews because the Jews own all the banks. You know, we wouldn't have an economy if it wasn't for the Jews. And Haim Solomon, you know, he funded the Revolutionary War. And we wouldn't have won the war if it wasn't for the Jews. And the Jews wrote the Bible. And the Jews do this. And the Jews do that. And we all just need to go sing the praises of the Jews because in that, the seed of Abraham, all the nations of the world shall be blessed. And right here in Galatians, it mentions that very verse. I, I Listen... I'm tired of getting called a heretic for believing this way. I just listened to a guy that I know, a guy that I like. He was preaching a message and he starts talking about replacement theology, which, by the way, is a heresy. But then he didn't explain why. He didn't give one single verse to prove that that's a heresy. He just called it a heresy. And they'll call these people a heretic. And he's you got all these people out there claiming and just talking about how bad this is. And yet nobody uses any scripture. And I listened to one of my favorite preachers one time preach a message on this subject, and he used four verses. He used four verses in the whole message. He used Genesis 12, 1 through 3, where it talks about a nice seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. And then he started talking about blessing Israel, blessing Israel, blessing Israel, you know, yay for Israel, yay for Israel, you know, 1948, you know, uh, you know, the Six Day War, you know, they start talking about all these things, they're giving a history lesson. Now, who knows how true that stuff even is? And then. The fourth verse he used was pray for the peace of Jerusalem in Psalms. But nobody ever reads the rest of the chapter where it says, because the house of the Lord is there. Is the house of the Lord in Jerusalem? No, the Bible has told the Jews, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Okay? We don't need it. Now, if you want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem because the house of the Lord is there, that's fine. But understand our body is the temple of God. Our body is the house of the Lord. And so, you know what? I'll pay for this Jerusalem right here. And you pay for your Jerusalem wherever you're at. We can pray for peace. And if you want to pay, pray for peace over there, go right ahead. But don't think you're obeying that verse in Psalms when you're doing that. You're not. The house of the Lord is not there. And, and four verses. And that was it. And these people think they can call us a heretic because of what we teach. Because look what it says right here. I mean, I, mean, I, I just I want to start throwing something right Genesis, turn to Genesis 12. I'm going to refute replacement theology today. And they'll read those three verses, and then they never go to Galatians. They never ever go to Galatians. In verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the first of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be con Confirmed, no man disannulth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. The Jews, right? He saith not in the seeds as of many, but as of one, and thy seed, which is Christ. Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. It was Jesus Christ that all the nations of the world were blessed. It was through Jesus Christ. And you, man, I'm telling you, I'm... I'm starting to, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get a little aggravated. I hate to be this way, but you know, I'm, I'm about ready to just start taunting these people. You know, just, you know, what are you morons going to do with that passage? You know what you're going to do? You're going to shut your Bible and just call me a heretic. And you know what? Fine. I'll say you're an idiot because you just, I mean, you're going to read Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and then just call me a heretic when I just read Galatians chapter 3, and showed you exactly what that says? I mean, it's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. And these people are ridiculous. And, you know, I, everybody talking, you know, saying, you know, Brother Tom is going off the deep end. You know, Brother Tom is going nuts. Well, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to make it any plainer. If you really think you're going to convert me by reading Genesis 12, 1 through 3 to me over and over and over and over again and ignore Galatians chapter 3, I don't have to listen to you. I'm, I'm, I'm practically taunting people with the passage in Romans. I, I can't even think what it is off the top of my head. I ought to know it by now. I keep telling it to people. You know, they that are of the flesh are not the children of God. I keep trying, I keep shoving that down people's throats. Nobody wants to talk about that. But listen, the seed of Abraham, it was always about faith. Those that be of faith. They are the children of Abraham. Listen, if you want to get blessed because you were a blessing to the children of Abraham, do something for me. All right? Do something for each other in here. Those of you that are of faith, that's where you'll get blessed. 
Listen, I knew a preacher that was trying to raise money so they could help buy weapons and things for the Israeli army. So they could kill Muslims who are equally the children of Abraham as the Jews. Do you know how phony and how hypocritical that is? You're going to get churches to use their missions money. We're supposed to be trying to get the gospel to people so they can go kill Muslims. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. What in the world? And Baptist, man, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm just amazed at the stupidity. I don't know if it's all the television they're watching. I don't know if they're getting dumbed down from the internet and social media. But when you start falling for this stuff, listen, you are an idiot. And I don't care. These people are men of God. You shouldn't say that. No. If you think that we should be raising money and giving it to an Israeli army so they can help them kill Muslims, you are an idiot. You are not a man of God. You haven't got a clue of what the Bible says. And I'm telling you, I'm done listening to stuff. I'm Mr. Nice Guy's gone, folks. All right, you know, Mr. Nice Guy, you know, he he's gone. I'm I'm done being diplomatic with these people. I, I'm done. These people are denying the scriptures. And you know what? Jesus was pretty. He was pretty brutal. These people. You know, say, you know, I'm not. You know, if I deny, I'll be a liar like unto you. Oh, how dare he say that to religious establishment? Well, it was true. And listen, being the seed of Abraham was always about faith. It was never about a physical people. Never. Never. It was always about those who are of faith. The law had to be given because... Or look, look at verse uh, 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Do you all see that? God promised Abraham that a seed was going to come. Okay, And that seed we know now was Jesus Christ. Abraham didn't know that. They didn't understand that in the Old Testament. The law that was added later, 430 years later, that law that was added... It was added because of transgression. God had to give the nation of Israel a law so they would survive. Y'all understand that they barely survived as it was. The devil made many attempts to wipe them out because they were so stinking wicked. And so God gave them a law so they could survive until the seed came, until the promise came, until Jesus Christ would be born. And that law was given for protection. Until the seed came to be given to the one that it was promised to. Listen, that land over there, you know, it's, it's not promised to the Jews. It was promised to Jesus. And the truth is that land is not even what was promised to Jesus. Listen, you got these people out there too. They'll go and they'll pull all these verses from the Old Testament and they never look at what the New Testament says about God's eternal covenant with Israel and these eternal promises that he made. And then they'll apply it to the land of Israel, saying it belongs to the Jews. But listen, we believe when we get saved, we get eternal life, correct? Well, if we have eternal life, is it possible to temporarily lose it and get it later? I mean, kidding out. All right, well, how about this? How about a per when, you, when you get saved, you're definitely going to heaven. There's no doubt about that. But there might be a period of time where you don't have eternal life. But God's not going to let you die during that time because He promised you would have eternal life. No, we have it the whole time, don't we? And if God gave that land to Israel for an eternal promise, how come they didn't have it for 1,900 years? You know why? Because it wasn't about that land. For 1,900 years, they didn't have it. And isn't this earth all going to burn one of these days? So that land is not eternal. That was not the eternal possession. It was the heavenly Jerusalem. Why can't these people see this? Listen, they didn't understand these things in the Old Testament. But we have the New Testament. Why can't it, it's, it's as plain as the nose on your face and they still can't get it. I, I, don't, I, just, I don't understand it. And so, understand that, you know, people too, you can tell them these things, but no, they're, 
There's still something for the physical nation of Israel. God's not done with Israel. You know, if you say that enough times, people will believe it, no matter how much they read the Bible. I had said to me just this week, I don't believe God's done with Israel. And show me that verse in the Bible. I heard another guy say it this week too. I was listening to a guy preach a message and he said, God's not done with Israel. Go read Romans chapter 11. Well, yeah. You know what? One way I shut everybody up who bugs me about this stuff. I always tell them, go listen to my message on the fullness of the Gentiles. It's from Romans chapter 11. I prove that everything in Romans chapter 11 is fulfilled. And I never hear from them again. All right? So if anybody's ever bugging you about this stuff, tell them to go listen to that message and they will never bother you again. You know why? Because it just... It destroys the only verse they've got. And all Israel shall be saved. People don't even understand what that means. It's real easy if you actually read the whole chapter, but they only want to read the one verse. Kind of like what they do with Genesis. They don't read that and they don't, they don't go to the New Testament. It's so easy to prove. And you know what? Bill Grady, he's the guy going around pushing all this stuff. He called me on the phone one day right after I listened to his message. And Brother Mark, he gave me his book. I read literally before you get to chapter one in the dedication of the book. I, and, and I did. I, to, I told him to go listen to my message on that. And I never heard from him again either. I, and I don't, I don't know if he listened to it or not. But you know what? Even if he did, he never listened. He spent 18,000 hours working on that book. 18,000 hours. After 18,000 hours of working on a book about Israel... You know what he put in the dedication before you even get to chapter 1? He says, this book is dedicated to Almighty Jehovah and His future bride Israel. And then he puts Hosea chapter 2 verse 19. Turn over to Hosea chapter 2 verse 19. 18,000 hours and you said that? What in the world are you talking about? Well, look what it says in Hosea 2.19. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercy. That's God talking to Israel. Well, let's read a little bit more. And I will betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them that were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Does that sound familiar to anybody? I believe that verse is somewhere in the New Testament that I don't think these dispensationalist people realize is in the Bible. Let's go look at that passage in Romans chapter 9. You see, the only verses these people are allowed to read in Romans 9 are just the Romans road verses. You know, 3.23, 10.13, 6.23, verses like that. They don't read all the chapters because it would destroy their teaching. It would destroy their Zionist stupidity. If they would read all of Romans and look what it says, because here's what they teach in dispensationalism is that, you know, the Gentile church is the bride of Christ and Israel is the bride of God. That's what they teach. But and right here in Hosea it talks about God betrothing. He's talking about Israel. But wait a minute. Who is God? Jesus is God. And who is Israel? Well, it also says in Romans and I can't get anybody to talk about this verse either. They are not all Israel that are of Israel. Uh, it's The truth is, those who are of Israel are those who are of faith. Like we've been talking about. That's who Israel is. God said, you know, I'll, he's talking about, talking about Israel. Yeah, God's bride is Israel. But Jesus is God. And those who are of faith are Israel. And right here in Romans 9, 23. Nope, that's talking about the physical nation of Israel there in Hosea. Are you sure? Go ahead. Argue. I'm about to make you look like an idiot. All right. Go ahead. Argue with me about that. Verse 22. What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? That's talking about the physical nation of Israel, by the way, which ceased to exist in 70 AD. They were destroyed. And yes, there are remnants of the descendants, but there is no physical nation of Israel. I don't care what they did in 1948. 
That is not, God does not recognize them as Israel. They are not Israel. 1948 is a complete and total fraud, is a lie. That is not the nation of Israel over there. We do not need to bless those people. They are just as wicked as the Palestinians, maybe even more wicked. They are not Israel. That is an antichrist cult that's over there calling themselves Jews. They say them they're Jews, but they do lie. They're the synagogue of Satan. And look, let's keep reading. I got off track here. Verse 23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in O.C., which is Hosea. I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which were not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it is said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Who is he talking to here? He's talking to... This, this is a Pauline epistle too. Do you all realize even in the dispensational world we're allowed to claim these verses? This is written by Paul to the church. He's our apostle. We can actually listen to his stuff according to the dispensationalists and according to their own rules and their own book written to us that we are actually allowed to claim. Paul quotes Hosea and applies it to us who are not just of the Jews, but of the Gentiles also. And you know what? I wish I had time to talk about Jeremiah. I listened to one of these guys that are using Jeremiah, and I'm telling you, you know, you give me a book of the Bible, I'll take any book of the Bible, and I'll just totally refute and destroy Zionism. Any book of the Bible. Oh man, they've got that one verse though in Jeremiah that sounds really good. Well, just read, also, here's the rule to defeat the Zionists every time. Just read the verses before and after. They can only take a little bit here and there. You know, Bill Grady, he can make himself sound smart when he puts a verse from Hosea in there because your average Baptist has never read the book of Hosea. And they definitely don't know the Bible good enough that when they read that verse in, in Hosea, they're like, wait a minute, where have I heard that before? Where have I heard that verse before? Yeah, it's in Romans, one of the books that we're allowed to read and claim for ourselves according to the dispensationalists, but they still don't get it. And so... It, listen, it's dead wrong. 18,000 hours, and he put that in the dedication? Claiming God has a different bride? The physical nation of Israel? That's ridiculous, folks. That, that's moronic. These people need to be run out of churches on a rail for just being stupid. The Bible says not a novice. That's one of the requirements for a bishop. And they can't even get that? It's not that hard. Yeah, I, maybe it is hard after years and years and years of brainwashing. You know, I don't know what all they do to those people in that Ruckmanite cult down there in Pensacola. You know, I know he was a disciple of his. And when I talked on the phone, he kept talking about Peter Ruckman, Peter Ruckman, Peter Ruckman. And you know what these people don't realize too? The church he had just preached at, when I was talking to him, he was insulting the pastor and that whole group because of how ignorant they are in theology. And I didn't have a good argument for that when he did that either. I, 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 they, they don't know much about theology. They believe in Zionism. You know? they, they believe in a pre-trib rapture. But you know what he does? He goes and he insults these people. And, but you know what? They go to these churches. You know why? Because fundamental Baptists were the King James people, were the Zionist people, and it's a good place to sell your books. And what a phony, what a liar, what a nincompoop when it comes to the scriptures to think that listen israel was destroyed in 70 a.d to try to talk about an eternal covenant an eternal land that god promised israel it makes no sense unless it was a spiritual covenant like god said israel's never had all the land god promised them they've never had it and 1948 was a fraud and the all israel that will be saved it's going to be those who are of faith. The real seed of Abraham. We are joint heirs with Christ. You know why? Because if you're in Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. Jesus Christ was that promised seed. And all those of faith, the Bible says, we're the children of promise like Isaac. And all I have to say after that is what are you going to do about that Zionist? Yeah, checkmate. You're done for. You know what? You're the heretic for believing that stuff. It, do, it doesn't get any clearer than that. And so, Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham. 
And if we are Christ, then we are Abraham's seed also. Where did you get this? You know, how were you able to figure out this time? Well, I, had, I was blessed. I, got, I had years, I had this teaching going on in the background that I never realized how important it was. And I think it's a thing that got me over. And it was that song I sang a million times as a kid. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. So are you. Y'all know? So let's just praise the Lord. You know how many Zionist churches that song is sung at? Well, that should be unscriptural in those churches. I never realized just how scriptural that song was. And maybe, maybe that's what finally won me over. I don't know. But anyway, so I hope that was a help to you tonight. So with that, let's all stand together.